Amen. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> well, I want to talk to you a little bit morning, uh, this morning about vision. Um, Bill Hybels very famously said that vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. A picture of the future that produces passion. I realise that today it's quite hard to have vision for anything beyond 10 o'clock this evening. I do acknowledge, I acknowledge that. It's very difficult, isn't it, today to really think of anything beyond the very immediate critical issue of this football game that's happening tonight. But actually it's quite a good illustration because for 55 years people have held in their mind a picture of something that might happen in the future, that they long for in the future. And it has instilled in millions of people a huge amount of passion. And uh, of course this evening we will wait as well. I mean it's, in some ways it's happened because they're in the final, we'll see whether they win or not. But it's quite a good illustration of a picture of the future that produces passion. And if we might just for a few moments lift our eyes beyond the very immediate, it would be great to think about what is our picture of the future that produces passion? What's our vision? And I want to just talk a little bit about that from, um, from John chapter 4. So if you've got a Bible with you, just open your Bible to John chapter 4. Turn your Bible on to John chapter 4, however your Bible works. Um, just let's just take a look at this passage just for a few moments together. It's a very familiar story. It's the story of Jesus meeting this Samaritan woman uh, at the well. Jesus uh, enters into Samaria. He enters into what is enemy territory. And as he uh, is wandering around in Samaria, he comes across a well. And at the well, he sees a woman. And it's an unusual scene because we know that um, back in those days and in parts of the world today where people still have to collect water, the people go to collect water in the cool of the day. They go in the early morning. Um, but this woman was there in the heat of the day, in the middle of the day, and she was there alone. And it's an unusual scene, and as we discover more about this woman, as the chapter kind of goes on and the story unfolds, we discover that she's probably there on her own because she is not well liked by the women of the village. She's not highly thought of, and she has done what she can to avoid them, and no doubt they have done what they can to avoid her. And so she's there in the middle of the day, alone. And what Jesus encounters in this woman is probably someone who is hurting, who's lonely, who's broken, who's angry. But on this particular occasion, everything is about to change. Jesus and the woman engage in conversation. You can read the story of their, con of their conversation as you journey through John chapter 4. They talk about a number of different things, but towards the end of the conversation, they begin to talk about the Messiah. And this is what the woman says. Verse 25. The woman said to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. It's an amazing moment. This moment changes everything for this woman. She actually becomes like the first unofficial apostle. We don't read of Jesus sending her, but she is so amazed at what she's encountered at the well that she rushes back to the village and she begins telling everybody about her encounter at the well with the man who is the Messiah. And this um, is how the story continues. Verse 39. It says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. 
verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. It's an amazing story about individual and community transformation. Both the woman and the, her community are transformed by the good news of Jesus. Imagine what it might look like. What imagine what it might be like to live in a community, to work in a community where almost everybody, or at least most people, are followers of Jesus. Where most people have encountered Jesus for themselves and most people are seeking to follow him, to live a life of his disciple. I wonder what that might be like. My vision is that we might see individual and community transformation as the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed and demonstrated in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my vision, that we might see individuals and even whole communities transformed by the good news of God's kingdom as that message is proclaimed and demonstrated in the power of the Holy Spirit. I was here this morning praying and I looked up and I saw that banner at the back of the church and I've just been noting that banner quite a bit over the last few weeks and it says the parish church of St Philip Sherwood living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my vision and actually as I read that I know that that's been the vision of this church for a long time. That's what this church has been about. And I believe actually it's the vision, I believe it's all of our vision, because actually I believe it's the vision that Jesus himself gave to us before he ascended into heaven. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. What is it that's required to see a vision like that take place and to occur? Well, I'm not claiming that this is a definitive list, but I just want to talk about four things that I think are critical um, to see the vision that Jesus gave to us, the vision that this church has hold, held for a long time and I believe continues to hold. What is critical to that vision? Well, four, let me mention four things. The first thing, I think, is <clears throat> a community of spirit-filled, devoted followers of Jesus within the wider community. When you think about the story of the early church, there was that incredible little devoted community of disciples within the community of Jerusalem. And the amazing thing is that God, generally speaking, tends to work in partnership with his people. And so I think the first thing that's critical is for there to be a devoted community of disciples within the community. The second thing is persistent prayer. Because it's often been said that no great move of God has ever occurred without persistent prayer. And actually I believe if we want to see individuals transformed, if we want to see a community transformed, it requires persistent prayer in the good times and in the tough times. 
The third thing that's required, I think, is the proclamation of the gospel. The good news needs to be spoken. Paul said, faith comes through hearing the word. And so there's a sense in which the name of Jesus needs to be spoken. It needs to be preached from here. But more than that, it needs to be spoken in conversations. Jesus needs to be talked about. Stories of Jesus need to come up in conversations with others. The good news of the gospel in some way needs to be communicated. It needs to be spoken. It needs to be on our lips. And the fourth thing, I think, is that the good news of the kingdom needs to be demonstrated. It, um, people need to see it and they need to experience it for themselves. One of the reasons the early church grew so incredibly was partly because they spoke it. It was partly because people encountered it through the miraculous. People were healed. People were raised from the dead. Those things happened. And also it grew rapidly because people saw the radical sacrificial love that the Christian communities had within communities that actually persecuted them. We could think of countless examples of the way that the early church sacrificially loved the communities in which they lived. And because of that, people were drawn to them. One of the positive things that's come out of what, have, of course, has been a really difficult season in all of our lives has been uh, our community larder. And um, that has been an amazing place in which people have been able to see and experience something of the kingdom of God. When we've fed people, we've been seeking to express to them in a practical way, the genuine love that God has for them, the genuine care that he has for them. But more than that, I know that in that place, the good news is spoken and the good news is experienced in other ways. I had a lovely uh, moment this Tuesday. I was, I'd been promoted this Tuesday. I'm normally on the door. I think Lisa thinks I can't do any harm out there. Just keep him out of the building. It's probably for the best. But I was promoted today. I was on the tins on Tuesday. So... I felt I was quite honoured. But um, <clears throat> this lady came up to me on Tuesday and she said, um, and I, met, I prayed for her the week before. And uh, she, she'd come, I'd just chat into her on the door and she said to me, um, I said, How's your week been? She's not been very good. I said, oh, Why is that? And she said, um, I've had terrible pains in my neck and, um, and it's been in my arms. And I got a new job three weeks ago, but I haven't been able to start it yet because I've been in too much pain. So I said to her, I said, well, can I pray for you? And she said, yep. So we I prayed um, with her. And she came up to me on Tuesday on the tins. And uh, she said, by that evening, all of the pain in my arms had gone. And most of the pain in my neck had completely gone. And she said, he has done something for me. And I didn't know whether she meant me or God. <laughs> but I said to her, I said, he's done that because he loves you. And uh, then I gave her a tin of tomatoes. Um, but, um, but the point, and, that, and I, that's just, it was just an encouragement. It was an encouragement to me. I hope it's an encouragement to you. I know that if we went around the Larder team, there would be lots of stories like that. And we praise God for every one of them. But it's just an example of the way that people can come and can some, to taste and see and experience something of the kingdom for themselves. Now I know, as I say that, that for lots of people, you can't be at the larder. And the reason you can't be at the larder is because you're working. And you are working for the NHS, or you're working in a school, or you're working trying to keep a business alive so that people have jobs at the end of all of this. I understand that. And that is as much kingdom as anything else that we do. And I know that some of you can't be the Lord because you maybe physically are less able to be there. But I know that you pray. And that's as much kingdom as anything else that we do. It's all kingdom because we're kingdom people. Um, but it's just a good example of 
people being able to see and experience something of the good news of the kingdom of God. One other thing, let me just say this before I close. There's lots to be encouraged about. But some of us meet, again those who are able, we meet, we've been meeting every morning to pray over the last few weeks and it came up at one of those, on one of those occasions, someone just shared a story. It was anecdotal, so I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily 100% accurate, but it was anecdotally the case. She, this lady, um, the, the person that shared this was, has a friend who works for the local domestic abuse charity. Um, the lady was told by her friend that 60% of phone calls to the domestic abuse charity come from our community. And when I heard that, it just really broke my heart, actually. Because I thought, like, there's a lot to celebrate. Every time we hand out a tin of tomatoes, it's something to celebrate. Because it's an expression of God's love. Every time we get to pray with somebody, it's something to celebrate. Because it's an expression of his love. Every time one of our congregation go into the workplace and do and serve God in that place, it's something to celebrate. But when I heard that, I thought, there's so much as well still to be done. There's so much still to be prayed for. There's so much of the kingdom that we still long to see in our community. I'd love that, I'd love that, statistic. I mean, I'd love that statistic to be that there's no calls to the domestic abuse hotline. You understand, of course. But I'd love to see that number drop in our community. Because we want people to experience the love and the good news of Jesus and what that means for their relationships in the home as much as what it means for their relationships in a church and for this broken woman on this day when she met Jesus her whole life was changed because she was broken and she was hurting she was angry and more than that the life of her whole community was changed and I guess that's my vision for St Philip's. I know it's been the vision of this church for a long time, way before I was here. And I love that. We're going to take a moment to pray.